We start on an auspicious note. The Chinese New Year begins today, so I wish all of you, and especially our Chinese participants, a very happy New Year. I take this opportunity to acknowledge all our sponsors, without whose support an event of such a magnitude could not have been organized. We gratefully acknowledge our academic sponsors, Isa Mohali, CSIR India, Suraj Manrao Student Science Fund. We gratefully acknowledge all our corporate sponsors, the platinum sponsors, Bruker Biospin Switzerland and Geo Limited, gold sponsors, Chromoshemi Laboratories, CyNMR Chemicals Private Limited, silver sponsors, Merck, ACD Labs, Lab India, and Oxford Instruments, and premium sponsors, Siemens Health Healthineers, and Neotel Systems and Services. For the lighting of the lamp, I now invite on stage Professor Devi Sarkar, Director Isa Mohali, Professor Khetrapal, Distinguished Professor CBMR Lucknow, Professor William Price, Western Sydney University, Australia, and Professor Surya Prakash, ISC Bangalore, President of the NMR Society India. I now invite Director Aiza Mohali, Professor Sarkar, to say a few words. Sri Satnam Vaiguru, Satsiyakal, Namaskar, good afternoon. All our distinguished guests, for this August gathering and all our staff members of Aisar Mohali, our dear students, and of course, Kavita. So it is indeed a great privilege and honor for me to welcome you all for this very, very uh, important meeting for which the whole world is benefited from medicine to biology to agriculture to everywhere because we need to know the structure. I wish one day I was talking to our uh, professors, Khatrapalji and our president, this year president, they said, what is the maximum, what is the absolute technique to know the structure? They said, liquid, enema, like 1000 megahertz, something like that coming up, and solid X-ray. He said, can you know the structure of God? So can an enema be found out very soon where you can have the structure of God? So I think that may be the ultimate of 
and what we can determine the structure. So, and anyway, I understand a bit of it because I was taught in MSc Chemistry in Banaras in the university. And then I later on I changed my, my plans to come to biology, thinking that enamel is very tough, I cannot understand. But now I see without enamel, biology or any, anything is not possible, particularly. Without, I think maths, they may not need enamel. So physics, chemistry, biology, and medicine. And as you know, all of you know, Professor Khetrabal. Sir, you are in PG, I, I think, uh, sorry, you are in that, um, uh, what is that institute, uh, medi medical? You are there, right, sir? Yeah. Uh, that, uh, Sanjay Gandhi. Yes. Sanjay Gandhi Institute of Postgraduate Medical Research in Lucknow. And anyway, he is one of the join in this field from India. Like I, when I, Kavita introduced me, I said, he's the textbook of NMR in India. So anyway, I think so many other people from all over the country and all over the world. I'm very delighted to see all of you. And without taking much time uh, of your important and very uh, significant deliberations, I welcome you all in the city, beautiful. And please try city, actually here, we have a hub of everything, from agriculture to medicine, to chemistry, to physics, what not. So I think God, Vaiguru, our Supreme God has given us so many things. So I'm a bit tempted and excited and impatient how to utilize the fullest of the full of the advantages and the facilities given to all of us. So with this, I wish you all very good good luck and enjoyable time for, I think, four days, right, Kavita? The four days meeting. And I congratulate, congratulate you all and Kavita to hold this meeting. It's very, very, I think, uh, I, I, I understood that about 250 or 260 delegates, including our students. So, of course, we are all here for the students. So, I wish the students would be benefited to the extent, uh, fullest extent. So, with this, I uh, again thank you all for this privilege. And if you kindly excuse me, I think just after that, and whenever Kavita allows me, approves me, I may be uh, allowed to go out. <laughs> <laughs> of this hall, uh, because to do some something else, which is also very much allowed me and need me. So with this, I beg your excuse to leave the hall. So thank you so much. I now invite President of the NMR Society of India, Professor Surya Prakash from IIC Bangalore, to say a few words. She said few words, but I have to read a lot because as a president, I have to tell something more about the society. Anyway, good evening to all of you. I welcome you for this 24th session of the NMRS. And I would like to tell that how the NMRS activity began here. The NMRS, uh, NMRS activity in India was initiated more than six decades back. And many Indian stalwarts have a distinct record of seminal contributions to NMR that are relevant to diverse areas such as chemistry, biology, physics, medicine, etc. The heightened research activity progressed in conjunction with the scientific advancement and technological development prompted a group of renowned magnetic resonance spectroscopists of India to establish National Magnetic Resonance Society in 1996, with its registered office in IASC. And I'm happy to share with you that as of today, the society has nearly 1,000 active researchers as life members, 42 honorary members, and seven corporate members. Every year, the society also elects distinguished overseas scientists as its honorary members, the long list of honorary members contains internationally lauded scientists, including Nobel laureates such as Richard Ernst, Kurt Othrich, and many other distinguished solvers like Alex Pines, E.D. Becker, P.C. Lauterberg, K. Akasaka, Robert Captain, I.C.P. Smith, J.R. Binbro, Seiji Wagawa, Advax, to mention a few. Of course, there are, there is a long list. I am not mentioning everything. Ever, is, ever since its inception, the society has been striving to promote scholarly exchange of multifaceted development and applications of magnetic resonance by holding annual meetings spread all across the country. That is to reach the broader audience and to encourage researchers to discuss the latest findings. 
The previous meetings were held at Bangalore, Amritsar, Karakpur, Tejpur, Lucknow, New Delhi, Mumbai, Hyderabad, Chennai, etc. The record number of participation of globally acclaimed scientists from all across the globe, increasing year after year, has given these annual meetings an international character. The NMR is always playing a dominant role in nurturing the younger generation and also to instill the deeper interest on the developments and applications of macroresonance by frequent organizational symposia, conferences, workshops, summer schools, etc. Over the years, the magnetic resonance activity in the country has experienced an incredible growth in multiple dimensions. NMRS is serving as a network in bringing together many active research groups. The annual meetings of NMRS are unique for their profundity, immensity, intellectual diligence, and stimulating oral and poster presentations. In the next few days of deliberations, we will have thought-provoking discussions consisting of plenary talks, invited talks, short and oral poster presentations covering wider range of magnetic resonance. I am sure all of you will release this academic fees and have ample opportunities to exchange ideas. As a current president of NMRS, I would like to take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to all the delegates who have come from all across the globe, uh, globe and wish all of you a pleasant stay. Many have contributed in organizing this event and strived hard to put all, all of us together to render this a successful conference. I would like to take this opportunity to heartily congratulate all my faculty colleagues, especially Professor Kavita, Professor Arvind and their team, and, and their, all their colleagues at IAC, Aisar Mohali and the enthusiastic local organizing team for taking this academic initiative and sincerely thank them for doing an outstanding job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zuruprakash. We will now begin the first academic session of the evening, which will be a plenary lecture delivered by Professor William Price. I now request the session chair, Professor Ketrapal, to say a few words about uh, William Price and introduce him. to hold this National Magnetic Resonance Society meeting here in such an excellent environment and place. My special congratulations are to Professor Kavita for so nicely organizing. And let me tell you, she is the first woman scientist who has organized the National Magnetic Resonance Society meeting in the past 24 years. And almost, I would say, her team, she is the only faculty member in the department, and she has tried to organize it with almost everybody from the ISER, and it shows her management capability also, and we must thank her very much for doing such an excellent job. <laughs> now, let us start our academic session. Let me introduce Professor William Price. He currently holds the chair of medical imaging physician in a School of Science and Health and School of Medicine in Western Sydney University. He is the Director of Biomedical Magnetic Resonance Facility and the Director of the Western Sydney University Node of the National Imaging Facility and he is also an adjunct professor at the National Wine and Grape Industry Center at Charles Stewart University and an honorary appointment in medical physics, Liverpool and <coughs> MacArthur Cancer Therapy Centers. He leads 
the nanoscale organization and the dynamic research group at Western Sydney University. He is going to talk on diffusion measurement, easier, better, and faster. And let us thank Professor White Price to accept the invitation, and we look forward to listening to him immediately. Professor. Then the stage is yours. to thank Kavita and all the other organizers for inviting me to come here. I'm truly honored and delighted to, to attend this conference. Uh, in fact, this is my, my first visit to, to India. So um, I'm, I'm enjoying it very much indeed. All right, today, um, with this lecture, I've entitled it Identify the Fusion Measurements Easier, Better, Faster. And I've worked in NMR Diffusion for most of my research career and I want to share with you a couple of the new things we've been doing but to put it in context How's this? Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All right, I, I first want to, to give a bit of context to diffusion measurements, but I also particularly want to talk about when we can trust the results. Look, they're very versatile, and I'll, I'll go through some of that, but in, in recent years, particularly with higher gradient strengths, I've become increasingly... <laughs> 
first line you're trying to get rid of me. <laughs> right. Anyway, um, I'll just a, a little little plug. I'm um, for past sins. I'm the editor in chief of a, a Royal Society of Chemistry book series, New Developments in NMR. Uh, in, in fact, I think in a, a recent volume come out, I think Kavita, you and Dean had a, a chapter. And I, I really hope in the future that we can get more Indian authors involved in, in this book series. We've got 15 volumes so far, and um, we're, we're looking to have a lot more. Anyway, back on to the, the real subject matter of this, this, um, this lecture. So these are my three co-conspirators, if you like, Scott Willis, Tim State Gardner, and Yuichi Aihara. Um, and because I'm likely to forget at the end, these are the, the different funding bodies and, and major collaborators that I have. A few, few months ago, I was asked to write a, a small article for the monthly magazine of the Australian and New Zealand Society for Magnetic Resonance. And, and one of the questions they asked me was, what do you think is the most important pulse sequence? And I really didn't have to think very long to come up with it must be the spin echo. And, and why the spin echo? Well, because it occurs in, in so many other pulse sequences. I mean, it's the basis of virtually every important pulse sequence. And what's more, every time that you think you understand it, something happens or someone finds something. And, and it's like an onion. A, a whole new layer of complexity is revealed. And so it is with diffusion. And so if, if you have um, such a, a spin echo pulse sequence and you go and insert gradient pulses, then you can measure diffusion. And, and it's really a, a marvelous technique how it works. And it all revolves around having a gradient pulse which will convert transverse magnetization into a helix. And, and how tightly this helix is wound depends on the area of the gradient pulse. And we can very nicely put this in terms of a parameter called Q, which is just the, the scaled area of the gradient pulse. And it's very nice because it had units of inverse meters. And so if we have a, a stronger or a longer gradient pulse, then we get a tighter helix. And with this, it's extremely important because it allows us to sense motion and position. After all, it's the whole basis of imaging as well. Now, when did all of this start, at least in terms of diffusion? Well, there was bits and pieces probably before Stegical and Tanner. But their paper in 1965 was absolutely seminal. And this paper alone has so many amazing ideas and they only went on to do about another two or three papers on diffusion measurements and personally as much as I admire their work I'm really thankful that they didn't do more papers because otherwise they would have done everything that I've ever thought of. It's really quite extraordinary what they, they managed to do in a couple of papers. So here's our diffusion sequence and I just want to run through some of the very salient points. To make this work, we must have two absolutely matched pair of gradient pulses. And the second gradient pulse, by virtue of this pi RF pulse, has the effect of unwinding a helix wound by the first gradient pulse. Now, if in the time scale of capital delta between these two gradient pulses, there's no motion, then this winding and unwinding is perfect, and you recover the echo, which is the initial transverse magnetization. And so, apart from spin-spin uh, relaxation, you would have no signal loss. And so, the idea is that if we do have diffusion, this winding and unwinding is not perfect, and we end up with a reduced signal, we get a, a signal attenuation, if you like. And, and from that, that reports on the mean squared displacement during capital delta. And, and if we have more diffusion, then we get a, a smaller signal. 
and consequently, if we're slow, doing slow diffusion measurements, then we need larger gradient pulses. And typically, a gradient pulse length will be between one and 10 milliseconds, and our measurement time scale for diffusion will be between 10 milliseconds and a second. Now, the thing I really want to emphasize is that these two gradient pulses must match. And it's kind of interesting that diffusion measurements were done before imaging, and yet diffusion measurements uh, are rather technically more difficult to do than imaging, because with imaging, you can get by with some dirty gradient, if you like. With diffusion measurements, you can't. Now, before 1990, if you wanted to do diffusion measurements, you had to make the equipment yourself. And so this comes from the days of my PhD, and here we have a, a modified barium probe. And so here's a, a coil that I wound myself, and I think I've still got marks in my thumb from winding these coils. And we put this on our modified probe. We got rid of the, the casing and replaced the top with perspex, so we can get, or try to get rid of any currents. And our, our first power supply was hardly sophisticated. It's based on a car battery. And you can see some initial measurements, some phosphorus measurements. And to do these, I had to get up, at least particularly for phosphorus, I had to start at about 1 o'clock in the morning. Because only when the FM radio stations weren't putting out very much would this probe not pick up too much interference. Here you can see some interference from a radio station. Anyway, this initial type of homemade gradient probe, the best we could do was 50 gauss per centimeter, which is just nothing by today's standard. Anyway, if you get all this together, you can go and do um, a diffusion measurement, and here's a carbon tetrachloride, and as we increase the gradient strength, you see our, our echo signal decays, and, and you can plot the data, and you can fit this equation to the data, and you come out with a diffusion coefficient. And, and that all seems very nice because, you see, you know all of the stuff in the green box here. Right? The only thing you don't know is the diffusion coefficient. But what I'd like to tell you, and something I want to stress in this lecture, is that we don't really know what's in the box because what we think we ask the machine may be not quite what we get. Um, oh, and if you're from the clinical world, you would write this equation as minus BD, where you park all of these variables into the variable B. Anyway, if, if you can do diffusion measurements, um, you can get a, a wealth of information, and you can get things like the size of the molecule, the environment, the molecules within, um, the geometry that the molecule is moving within, and if you have something like a liquid crystal, then you can get information of the ordering of the environment. And so, whether you're a biologist or a chemist, this is all extremely useful information. And, and with NMR, you can tackle diffusion measurements that you can't do with traditional diffusion measurement techniques. And so, this is some measurements I did on super cool water. And as you are probably aware, if you have very pure water and, and you don't have any dust, then if you cool very carefully, you can at least get to something like minus 35 degrees. Right? The, apparently the self-nucleation temperature of water is about minus 38. Anyway, if you have sufficient patience, you can go from room temperature where you have a diffusion coefficient of about 2.3 by 10 to the minus nine, and what I found is at minus 35, you can get 1.58 or 1.6 by 10 to the minus 10 meters squared per second. And this is very useful information if you're a chemist because the nature of the water to ice transition is not well understood. And, and so this data is, is very heavily used by such people and theorists trying to understand the nature of this water to ice transition. Well, after I did water, I then went on and do, did the equivalent measurements with D2O and I, I, I also did the measurements with, with saline. That was a more recent, that was only four years ago we did the, the work on saline. So what can we say? Well, in the last 50 years, we've gone from home-built to commercial equipment. Um, we've gone from low gradients to, to enormous gradients. We've gone from looking at just easy samples to now where we can include diffusion in imaging experiments. We can do all manner of complicated experiments. The initial 
diffusion measurements were on Fickian diffusion in low viscosity samples. Now with high gradients, you can essentially look at the diffusion in solids. Um, NMR has become the gold standard, if you like, for, for measuring diffusion. Um, I've, I've listed some references in this field, and if you're having trouble to sleep at night, I can truly recommend the second book. <laughs> um, all right, something, so let me just tell you a few more of the strengths of it. One thing compar compared to virtually any other method for measuring diffusion is that we can normally measure multiple species at once. So if you have some electrolyte solution or, or some mix, mixture, you can get the, diff, the, um, the diffusion measurements of all the species at, at normally the same time. Now, with the, the current technology, we can go from 10 to the minus 5 meters squared per second, which is the diffusion of a gas, up to, indeed, large polymers, about 10 to the minus 15 meters squared per second. Compared to other techniques, we're not limited by, by concentrations. As long as we can get sufficient NMR signal, we're okay. This, this is quite different to, say, many light scattering methods where you're, you're stuck at low concentrations. And as I mentioned, if, we, if you have, say, a, a diffusion, uh, sorry, an imaging probe, then you have triple axis gradients, and, and because the magnetic fields are, are, are vectors, you can combine them and, and you can measure diffusion along different directions. And, and so this gives you the chance of measuring things like diffusion tensors. And, and we can then go and combine diffusion measurements with other techniques such as electrophoresis. So I, I'm sure you'll agree it's an extraordinarily versatile thing. And, and so here's an example, a recent example of work we've been doing looking at grapes. And, and so this is uh, the microstructure of a, of a grape. And so by doing diffusion tensor analysis, you, you can see some parts of the tissue are isotropic, some are anisotropic. And, and so we've studied a lot of work, or did a lot of work on grape development. Now, the thing is that whereas when I started in diffusion, this was um, build it yourself now, it's commercially available. And, and so all of the, the major manufacturers, Brooker, Joel, Magritech, that they all have diffusion equipment. Right, so um, this is a, a, a Brooker high gradient probe. It now goes to 3,000 gauss per centimeter. And I'm aware that Joel has a, a also very good high gradient equipment. And, and now, because we have so much more sensitivity, we can look at many more elements in the, the periodic table. Uh, and so with, with diffusion, you, you can really do A to Z. And, and every year, I'm amazed at the, the different applications that come about. So I, I talked about the pulse sequence, and I talked about the different parameters like the gradient strength and capital delta. So a lot of what we do in my laboratory is working out ways that we can do the experiments better. Because if we can do them better, then our range of applications will increase. For example, if we can remove the deleterious effects of J evolution, then we're in much better shape for doing diffusion measurements of mixtures. If we can make capital delta larger, then we can probe macroscopic boundaries. Right. And, and in particular today, um, I want to talk about some of the issues with large gradient strengths. Um, I also want to talk about faster diffusion measurements and also extreme solvent suppression. So I, I thought it more logical actually to, to talk about better measurements first. And, and by better, I mean doing more accurate measurements because if we can't have accurate measurements, then our analysis is, is faulty. So this was um, an Australian Prime Minister during much of my childhood. This is Malcolm Fraser. Uh, and Prime Minister Fraser's, well, in fact, the only thing people remember about him saying is that life wasn't meant to be easy. And it was only years later when I was doing my PhD did I realize that, that Prime Minister Fraser must have had experience in doing NMR diffusion <laughs> measurements because they're certainly not easy to do properly. So, so what's the problem? Right? I mean, we, we get this lovely data. Here's some diffusion diffraction data. And, and so if you have, for example, water diffusing between planes and your, your gradient is orthogonal, then as long as your, your time span of measurement is enough that the water is sampling both sides of, of the slit, then you get this nice diffraction data, which is akin to single slit diffraction in, in physics. And from that, 
could analyze it, and even if you didn't make the sample, you could analyze it and then determine what the, the separation was. And, and of course, we've, we've seen um, in the literature, if you look, you'll, you'll see a lot of work with fiber tracks, and, and this all comes from doing diffusion measurements. And, and with diffusion, as I mentioned, we can do a lot of things on tissue microstructure, and I believe it's tomorrow, I think Professor Topgard will have a, a, a talk on something like this. So I, I really look forward to that. So, <coughs> but my, my message here is that as we go to, to large magnetic gradients, we have proportionally larger technical problems. And the calibration of high gradient pulses is particularly problematic. Right? And new users, and in fact, old users too, might appreciate the complications or some of the complications that arise. In fact, I often come across something which I just hadn't realized before. And so my point is that there's endless possibilities for misinterpretation. When we, when we do a diffusion measurement, we, we take a, a lot on faith. We, we assume that we've, well, we've written our pulse sequence and we assume that the spectrometer will um, We'll handle this with some fidelity, if you like. And, and so, typically, if you read any, any paper on straight diffusion measurements, you'll just see this simple version of the equation. And, and this may not be true, um, because for one thing, for this to be true, we, we need to have our, our gradient pulse reproducibility on the order of 10 part per million. That's probably not true. Um, we might specify this, but in fact, we might get something like that. Right. Um, and, and so we have problems like this where our assumptions might not be justified in, in reality. Now, there, there's many complications that limit accuracy. There's things like temperature gradients and convection, and these are, are well known. There's also things like sample vibration, particularly if you have a, a powdered sample. Um, I want to spend a, a couple of minutes talking about gradient constancy, um, eddy currents and reproducibility, and gradient calibration. Because if we want to compare data from, from different groups around the world, we really need to know when we can trust our results. And we also really want to be able to cross-check our results. And my, my feeling is like this, that if you um, work at low gradient strengths, like at 50 gauss per centimeter. On a, on a modern machine, this is normally very fine and you won't have too much problem. But when you go to a, a higher gradient strength, then you strike problems. And so it could be that as you go to a longer little delta, then the experimentally usable maximum gradient strength might decrease, or you might be limited by your duty cycle or something like this, but you really have to know, you have to be able to characterize your machine. Now, gradient constancy is a, a particular issue. Gradient coils are, are not perfect. They don't make a homogeneous gradient throughout the sample. It, it doesn't matter how hard you try. Um, and, and even if they did, on, on most samples, you'd be thwarted by background gradients due to susceptibility interfaces. Right? And, and so, here's an example a simulation uh, of water in an NMR tube. And I, I know these numbers are too small to read, but all you've got to know is that because we've got different coloration, it means that the background gradients are not homogeneous through the sample. And the situation can be much worse in real samples such as sandstone. And, and look, this is just a schematic of one of the gradient coils I wound during my PhD in a, a simple calculation I did. And again, I'm sorry, I know the numbers are too small, but the whole point is that there's only a very limited volume which gives you a constant gradient. And it can be very probe dependent. You might have two high resolution probes and you find that one will work, say, with a, a millimeter long sample and another very similar probe you find that you can't get good measurements out of. So if you do have background gradients, then the equation is not just this one. You, in fact, have these three pieces. Now, this last term, which is just from the background gradient itself, it is not really a problem, because as long as the background gradient hasn't killed all of your signal, 
then you can just normalize this out. And so that's, that's normally not such a problem. But what is really a, a very complicated problem is, is this cross term. And, and it's difficult for a number of reasons. The first being that you mightn't even realize that you've got it. And to start, if you look at this equation, you see that it doesn't matter where you place the gradient pulses in your sequence. Right? I mean, you see I've got a parameter here, T1 on T2. They don't occur in this. So if you have no background gradient, you're free to move your gradient pulses where you want. But as soon as you have background gradient pulses, uh, sorry, background gradient, then this is not true. And, and this g dot g0 cross term will give you a different result depending on where you put your gradient pulses. And further, you'll notice that we have a, a vector product. And so depending on the sign of the background gradient, we can get a very different result. And many people overlook this, and, and most people never show this equation. And, and yet, Stetchical and Tanner had worked this all out. I don't know why this is... I think you're going to get very bored watching this slide for the next 20 minutes. Um, okay, so... This is some, some work I did some years ago when I was in Sweden with Peter Stilves and, and Ole Soderman. And, and what I've done here is I got a, an NMR tube, a, a Shigami tube, and I, I took the plunger part out so that we'd have a, a significant background gradient. And then I did diffusion measurements where, the, where I used either positive applied gradients or negative applied gradients. And when I did this, you see I get a different result. Right? So you see up triangle is positive applied gradients, down triangle is negative applied gradients. And it's not simply that you can do both measurements and, and average them to get the correct result. It, this, this doesn't work. Right. And it's a subtle effect because if it's not, if you don't have very big background gradients, you might not even realize their presence. Right. But you can use this trick sometimes to check if you have them. But one point I'd really like to raise with you that people seem to have overlooked is that because it's a cross term between the applied gradient and your background gradient, even though the background gradient might be small, with a large gradient, large applied gradient, the product might be large. Now, it's been suggested that you can use bipolar gradient pulses to remove background gradients. And by and large, yes, you can. And, and many people use this. But there's an issue with them that I'd like to tell you about. And, and that is that you're asking the amplifier to put up a positive gradient pulse and very quickly a negative gradient pulse. And so what I would, would say is that particularly with high amplitude gradients, you might be asking a great deal of the amplifier if you're expecting to have perfectly matched pairs of gradient pulses. So you might be trading getting rid of background gradients for, for having not perfectly matched pairs of gradient pulses. All right, let me now turn briefly to, to um, gradient pulse reproducibility. As I mentioned, you need pulse pairs with, that are reproducible on the order of 10 ppm to do a, a good diffusion measurement. Well, you, you can easily go and look for eddy currents. You can do a, a simple sequence like this where you do a gradient pulse, you wait a short time, you acquire a signal, and, and you can keep on increasing this time until you're happy that you're no longer getting any distortion. And with the very early gradient probe I, I showed you in one of the first slides, well, the, the eddy current performance was rather poor. And so we had to wait, wait something like at least 100 milliseconds bef before we could stop having problems with, with eddy currents. With the modern probes, it's much better. Something like um, one millisecond. This is like one second. With a um, one, millise one millisecond. With the modern probes, it's much less. With a, a high, high gradient probe now, sorry, low gradient probe, you could do 100 microseconds. But still, with a very high gradient probe, you'll need something of the order of one to two milliseconds. Now, if these pulse pairs don't exactly match, then you'll get 
residual phase twist. And, and this will lead to artifactual attenuation. And, and many people think, oh, this is no problem. I can just go and do absolute value mode. I get rid of the phase distortion. Everything looks happy. But it's not a solution. And certainly, this whole issue with phase twist becomes an enormous problem when you're dealing with very large amplitude gradients. So here's some experimental data we did about six months ago. And, and this is a simple test. So this is um, lithium diffusion measurements in a, in, a, in a powder. And we've mismatched the second gradient pulse right, by a very, very small margin. And what's interesting here is that we get an effect that looks like diffraction. But, but of course, it's completely artifactual. It's not diffraction at all. And yet, if you're dealing with a, a sample that you don't really understand, and particularly if it's not homogeneous, if it's heterogeneous, then you might start to think, oh, maybe I, I've got something interesting going on here. And, and maybe you might, but you've got to be very, very careful because it's also very likely that you've got artifactual diffraction. And, and you can see here, too, that whether we take absolute value mode or, or phase sensitive, as you should, well, absolute value mode doesn't solve the problem. Um, to get rid of the phase twist problem, years ago, Peter Stu um, Peter Stu Paul Callahan came up with the idea of, uh, of the so-called Massey sequence, and the idea was that by acquiring the spin echo in the presence of the gradient, of a read gradient, then you had the, the chance of unwinding um, any phase twist, and you could um, get around the problem and do your diffusion measurement. But this is a very slow technique to run and it loses chemical shift information. So it's certainly not a, a general technique, it's a technique of last resort. Um, another thing you can do is to go and try pre-pulses. And, and so the idea is that maybe by doing pre-pulses, you'll increase the gradient reproducibility. And, and you might also have the added effect of, of matching any eddy, eddy current effects in the first tower period with the second, and so you kind of get rid of them. But there's, there's issues of the implementation. I mean, do you run them all at the same amplitude, or do you, as you increment the gradient strength, change the strength of the pre-pulses so that the total energy remains the same? It, it's a, a difficult question and one I don't really know the answer to. Um, but I do know that using them helps a lot, and I also know that using shape gradient pulses will, will help to reduce the generation of eddy currents. So, okay, you, you've, you've got your high, your high gradient probe, and, and you want to check What's my baseline? I mean, is it working? Can I trust it? So something that you can do is, is to go and get a sample, a very, very solid sample that you can be sure that you really don't have the gradient amplitude to kill. And, and so this is a, a, a type of um, glass ceramic that, that we got from the Ohara Corporation in Japan. And it, it's extremely solid. <coughs> and, and so, here, even though we've used rather enormous gradients, so this is 12 tesla per meter, the maximum gradient, you can see that within experimental error, um, that there is no attenuation. And so if we were to see some, then we, we would know for sure it was artifactual. Um, and this brings me to the, the last point of the, when I talk about gradients, and that's of calibration. And this is really critically important because unless you can accurately calibrate your gradient, then there's no point going any further. Right? And on a, a modern gradient probe, if you go into high gradients, you need to calibrate over a huge range of gradient amplitudes. And it's not straightforward. If you're dealing with low gradients, then you have the chance of doing one-dimensional imaging where you, you just acquire um, an FID in the presence of a gradient. And, and if you know the particular shape, you could then go and calculate the Fourier transform. And, and from that, you can work out what the, the gradient must be. It's a good cross-check, but it's not accurate. Right. And, and if you're dealing with a re real sample, sometimes it can be very difficult to tell the edges. And, and so it's not really um, a good way for accurately determining the gradient strength. When, when you, and, and I've mentioned that when you do this, you, you're really limited. You can't go to very high gradients, because as you do, you, the spectrum becomes so wide, you've got no signal. And, and so um, Wright and co-workers in 2004 came up with the idea of this two-step calibration where you, you first calibrate 
at, at low gradient strengths. And, and so then you'd have um, this low gradient strength pulse here. And then you could try to, with, with that, match it and get the calibration of a, a short, more intense gradient strength, uh, gradient pulse. But um, here we've still got the assumption that the area of the gradient pulse scales with the current. And, and we can't necessarily assume that. Right? And, and also, this method doesn't incorporate non-ideal gradient effects. Right? Now, the traditional way of calibration is, is to use a sample with a known diffusion coefficient. And, and this has its benefits, because if you calibrate with a sample of a similar diffusion coefficient, then you build in some of the problems that you can't otherwise deal with. Like, you know that the gradient is not homogeneous through the sample. And, and by doing this, you, you kind of build in the correction into the gradient that you calibrate. And, and so, to calibrate correctly with a calibrant, you need, need something with a similar diffusion coefficient, similar geometry, and similar experimental parameters. And, and you want something which is well-behaved, stable, reproducible, and, and easily obtainable. Right? And um, take a note, glycerol is no good because any small difference in moisture changes the diffusion coefficient very much. Right? And um, three years ago, we did a, a, a large study on looking at different calibrants that, that you can use, which are, are probably much better than, than water. So um, another attempt we had at trying to calibrate to, to higher gradient strength was, was to use the residual water in, in D2O. And, and so you can go to a, a certain gradient strength for the protons, then you can switch to deuterium, and then you can go to higher gradient strengths. But even so, you, you still run out of puff at the end because D2O was not um, particularly viscous. So um, this is what we've come up with recently. Um, and I like this because you can buy deuterated squalene. It's a bit expensive, but you can buy it commercially. Um, it diffuses much more slowly. And so this allows us to push out where we can calibrate our, our gradient strength to. Um, another issue which is blissfully overlooked is that, and this is why I say you must calibrate with the same shape. So these are calibrations done on the, the same probe, but just with different sample size. And, and so this is a maximum gradient strength. And you see it, it changes quite markedly depending on what size sample you've got. And so this just shows you that your gradient is not homogeneous through the sample. And if you want to get very accurate measurements and you want to be able to compare them, you, you must always calibrate with a sample of the same shape that you're going to use. Um, if you've got a triple axis gradient probe, things also get worse. And I, I know that it's very difficult to read this, but all I'm trying to show you here is that we've, we've looked at different um, combinations of the gradients to get different directions. And the, the circle is where it should be. So the, the, the cross is what, what was calibrated to be. And the circle was what was expected. And, and so what we find, at least on our probe, is that a combination of gradient directions may not be exactly the vector sum. And, and this is significant, because if you're trying to measure diffusion in a, an isotropic sample, you could come up with the wrong answer, merely just because of the, the gradient calibration. <laughs> All right, um, I'm running out of time, so let me turn to the, the last two things. Um, let me talk a little bit about solvent suppression. Um, I, I know I put this in the abstract, but there's certainly not time. So um, I've always been interested in, in sequences that are easy to set up and, and don't make the sequence longer. It's like mathematical equations. You can come up with a great, enormous equation. It might be correct, but no one will use it. You want something simple. So we all know this problem that these are the guys that you want, but you can't see them because you've got this enormous water peak. Um, it would have been in the early 2000s when I was sitting up in, in Sweden with, with Peter Stills. I, um, it just suddenly occurred to me one day that the Watergate sequence was in effect, a, a spin echo for doing diffusion. It just didn't have the, the pi pulse, the pi on two pulse out front. And with Watergate, you normally try to not 
lose signal due to diffusion, whereas with diffusion, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And, and so I realised that this was... Uh, you can tell them I'm almost finished. <laughs> um, but it, it's as beautiful and simple to set up. I mean, you don't really have... After you've calibrated a 90 degree pulse, you, you can just take off 6 dB and, 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 and you're set. Right? And some years later, I, I asked my then PhD student, Gang Zheng, to, to do the equivalent for the, the stimulate echo pulse sequence. Uh, and so this is what we, we got. And this is also very simple to set up and it's extremely robust. So let me show you. This is with the PGSE Watergate and, and here's some, some nice data with um, salicylate um, a, sorry, a salicylate binding study with albumin. Right. Um, and, and then this is some later work that, that Gung did, and, and this is a, a diffusion measurement on, on lysosine. <coughs> and because we've got asymmetric gradient pulses, then we, we need um, more reduced phase cycling. Right. And, and we could push that further, and we did. And, and so here's a, a highly optimized PGSD water gauge sequence. And, and with that, well, we, um, Gung had, had a, a background in environmental studies before he came from China. And so he was interested in, in dissolved organic matter. And so he went across to the pond outside my office and got a, a water sample. And th this pond water, I mean, to look at was completely clear. You'd think it was from the tap. And, and so this was a, a, a straight 90-degree um, pulse spectrum. You see, you can see nothing, you just see water. And anyway, by using the, the pulse sequence I just showed you and an extraordinary number of scans, then we did the diffusion measurement on the dissolved organic matter in, in the pond water. And, and so um, this is the results. And it's kind of interesting because straight from the diffusion measurements, you could get the average hydrodynamic radius. And, and because you had different diffusion measurements, then it, it certainly implied you had separate species. So, so, I'm, I'm coming to the last few slides. So, the last thing I want to tell you about is, is faster diffusion measurements. And I was interested in generally applicable methods. So, this was done by my, well, the first paper was by, by me with Tim and Neil, who's probably I hope, somewhere in the audience. Um, and, and then um, later, Mikhail did, did some, some further work on this. And, and so if we can do faster diffusion measurements, then we can make more systems um, accessible, particularly those which are time sensitive. And, and there's been many techniques reported that most of them contain what I call a, a fatal flaw. And so I suppose the real question is, what are the consequences of the recycle delay being less than five times T1? Right, now, of course, we know if we're doing a, a quantitative measurement like T1 or NOE, then we know that we really want to wait five times T1, or in fact, that NOEs may be even longer. And I had always thought that with diffusion, it was the same thing. I mean, hey, it's a, a quantitative measurement. But it, it turns out that this is not really true. Um, and and we'll, we'll come to that. But look, if we want to speed up a, a diffusion measurement, we've got two cases. The first is that we've got a, a weak signal, say like the diffusion of a protein, and we want a more efficient sequence. Or the second case might be that, let's say you're doing diffusion measurements on, on D2O, where you've got a, um, a sig significant signal, but you've got a, um, a very long T1. Or you're, you might be using, say, a, a stimulate echo sequence, and you've got a, a long phase cycle. What you'd really like is something where it requires minimal phase cycling because basically you've got enough signal in one scan. Now there, there's been two ways about this and very strange names, single shot sequences right, and, and one shot sequences. And so a single shot sequence gives you a complete measurement in one scan, a one shot sequence gives you reduced phase cycling. But as I mentioned, most of these uh, previous efforts have some kind of fatal flaw in that maybe they require very high signal to noise or maybe they lose chemical shift information so they're only good if you have a, a single species in your, your sample um, and also of particular interest if you're looking at anything but free solution 
if a fast method doesn't have a well-defined time scale, well then it, it, it's no use. And so I was after a, a general solution, especially for, for measuring weak resonances. So these are some typical um, previous efforts, so-called single-shot sequences. Look, that they all work. Some of them are, are complicated to set up. Um, and, and these are some one-shot sequences. And you know, one day it just occurred to me, it's very simple, you, you, let's see what happens if we, we just put a, a purge gradient pulse out the front. And, and we, we did this with this crusher gradient pulse, and, and we, we looked at what we could do um, in terms of shortening the recycle time. Of course, the recycle delay is our acquisition time plus the, the time before the, the, the first excitation pulse. And, and so we, we can easily show that we only need a, a, a few initial dummy scans to get a, a steady state. And um, we, we did all of the maths and the analysis and we, we could show you um, the optimal angle that you could use to, to run this faster and get maximum signal to noise. Um, you don't need to look at the graphs in detail. And, and we did the same analysis for um, the stimulate echo pulse sequence. You can run that in steady state as well. And <clears throat> if, if you go and analyze the data, then you, um, you, you find that you can in fact get down to something like a recycle delay of about <coughs> one T1 before everything falls apart. Right? And so you can go down about one T1 and still get a very accurate diffusion measurement. And of course you retain all of your chemical shift information and you also have your, still your capital delta, so you're still good for studying restricted diffusion. So um, after all I've talked about today, where have we got to? Well. Um, diffusion measurements are extremely powerful. Um, the range of applications are expanding exponentially. Um, I, um, I, I still collect papers in case I ever think of writing a second edition of a book, but honestly, there's so many papers coming out now, I think it would be just beyond me to, to, to cover them. The, the range of applications is going up so quickly. Right. If we're not careful of artifacts, then we get apparent time-dependent diffusion and diffusion diffraction data. And our, our calibration must be verifiable. And so with that, I, I've finished. And I, I thank you very much for your attention. Well, the talk is open for discussion, suggestion, and comment. Thanks for a very nice presentation. Um, you mentioned all these artifacts that you could encounter when you do these diffusion measurements. So if you buy a brand new MR spectrometer these days, can you trust the calibrations and that, that the machine is actually doing what you're telling it to do? Or do you have to do this all test by yourself if you buy, buy a brand new machine? Sorry, if you bought a, if you bought a new machine, would if I trust the calibration? Machine, yeah. hmm? If you buy a new machine these days, because I, I suppose things have become better over the years. I, I'm sorry, the, the, this microphone, I'm having real trouble to, to, to hear you with. Them. So if, if you bought a new machine, can you, yes. you, can you trust like, the calibration that they, they sell it to you with? Yes. Don't you mean? Yes. Uh, no, I would, I, I would absolutely go and, and calibrate everything myself. Uh, just, I would like to know, is there any way to probe anisotropic diffusion in uh, uh, like weekly order system like myself? Is there any, through via diffusion? Because in fact, uh, like, uh, Technique like neutron scattering is showing some anisotropy uh, through that axial ratio of the micelle, uh, that uh, semi major to semi max. But as well, especially NMR diffusion metry only gives a uh, isotropic diffusion. So, is there any way to get the anisotropic diffusion, uh, especially even though it is might weak? Just to study anisotropic diffusion, well, well yes, because I, I, I didn't explain this, but I, I should have, that um, the diffusion is measured in the direction of the gradient. 
And, and so either by orientating your sample, say for something like a goniometer, or as I showed with the slide where I, I, I tried to show with the calibration with a triple axis probe, you, you, can, you can define the, the direction that you're measuring diffusion. And, and so, for example, if, if you had um, like an aligned phase, then absolutely you can measure and, and characterize such a sample. I'm sorry, is that, was that your question? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, to, to what extent uh, it can uh, probe the actual ratio, at least to or the like the globular to ellipsoidal, it can span that range. Sorry, I, I... Uh, so what is the lower limit of the with the diffusion we can probe? What, what's the, uh, the the actual ratio? The, the rate, I mean the, the size. My, 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 uh, well, I mean, if, if you're studying something like a restricted diffusion, um, now you could probably get to, to um, something like a millimetre if you're using singlet states. That, that, that's possible. Um, and, and so, I mean, now, like, you can measure diffusion just for diffusion's sake, or you can use diffusion to probe the geometry that's occurring within. And, and so, be it on something like a, a micelle or, or a, a normal cellular system, you can get a great inference deal of information about tissue microstructure. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry, if I didn't answer your question, catch me afterwards. And yeah, I, 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 thank I, you. Okay, with this, we thank you very much for the On behalf of the Local Organizing Committee, I thank Professor Ketropal for chairing this session.